Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Bethany Young Holt, and I'm the director of the Initiative for MPTs. And we are delighted to have nearly 150, 130, 150 people registered um, today from across various time zones. Um, as we wait for people to join, we'd ask that you um, type your name and affiliation into the chat feature of Zoom. Um, and we also wanted to note that everyone will be muted during the discussion and then will be unmuted during the Q&A. So we'll give people a few minutes to join. Um, and we look forward to your seeing who's here through chat. Great, so we're, we're getting quite a nice group of people joining. Um, so just to let you know, yeah, we have people from the US, from Sub-Saharan Africa, from Europe. Um, so I will wait and let people get, get on before we dive in. So as, um, as we begin today, um, we will ask people to type in your questions for discussions during the talk, um, again, using the chat, chat feature. Um, and we will also be recording the webinar and posting it on our website at the impt.org soon after, after the webinar. So I'm delighted to be the, uh, moderating today's Let's Talk MPTs webinar um, with our expert panel of innovative product developers, social behavioral and clinical researchers from around the globe to have a discussion around integrating end user perspectives into MPT R&D. Now we have 90 minutes, um, so this is certainly, um, you know, time to sort of touch on these issues, but there's only so much that can be addressed. So we aim to highlight key issues and then also connect leaders that are working across disciplines to further stimulate innovation and collaboration. So for those joining who may be new to the NPT field, multi-purpose prevention technologies or MPTs are being designed to deliver combined prevention from unintended pregnancy, HIV, and other sexually transmitted infections in single delivery forms. They could be one-stop shop products that revolutionize sexual and reproductive health by incorporating prevention of HIV or other STIs into contraceptives, which are often um, less stigmatized. They could also reduce the burden of multiple clinic visits, which has become more of a challenge, as we all know, due to COVID. Um, and especially with COVID, the world is focusing more on self-care, universal care, and meeting people's comprehensive health needs rather than addressing um, health needs in silos and in MPTs could help address this need. So there are um, an array of about two dozen MPTs in development now with um, active funding and this slide illustrates those in development by delivery type. Um, these uh, include intervaginal rings, gels, fast dissolving inserts, films, implants, microarray patches and oral tablets. Um, NPT candidates um, include various combinations of contraception and prevention of HIV and other STIs. And today we'll be hearing from two product developers um, who are working on um, such NPTs, which is really exciting. Um, and while the majority of the NPT candidates are in early stages of development, some are in, in clinical stages and there's discussion about preparing them for market. So you can check out the, the MPT products um, in development in the uh, database at mpts101.org. And if you're aware of other MPTs that aren't included in there, please let us know. 
So as you're likely aware, MPT development is complex and among the many challenges is how to ensure that innovative MPT candidates are developed that are acceptable and can reach the hands of end users. And this requires the engagement of an array of multidisciplinary experts, including those with expertise in technical areas such as HIV, STIs, contraception, social behavioral market research, advocacy, funding mechanisms, and so forth. The initiative for MPTs is comprised of members such as you all on, on this call from across disciplines and continents and provides a platform where these multidisciplinary partners can um, convene and, and look at objective technical guidance and strategic planning related to MPTs. And by facilitating interdisciplinary and international partnerships through in-person and virtual convenings, we really hope to um, enable experts from across these disciplines um, to strategize. So in this vein, um, we've convened this learning opportunity today to help unpack issues related to the integration of end user perspectives into NPT um, product development. There's also resources related to NPTs um, on the NPT website at BIMPT.org. Um, so today's webinar, um, as I said, brings together NPT developers with um, product candidates in different stages of development and social behavioral and clinical researchers to discuss the social behavioral market needs um, of NPTs. And it, today's webinar builds on um, a USAID funded um, uh, activity that looked at biomedical HIV prevention product um, investment needs and, and a framework for that. And then more recently, um, the NIH convened a multi-day workshop um, on uh, social behavioral research um, in the fall of 2020. And I'm really, um, really happy to introduce you all to Dr. Travis Kent from NICHD, who um, is here with us now, who's going to provide a few reflections on that meeting um, in that workshop in September. Travis? Yeah, thanks, Bethany. Um, so before I dive into the meeting, I just sort of want to put the meeting in the context of some of the things that are going on at NICHD. Um, so recently, NICHD underwent a brand new strategic planning um, for, you know, 2020 and into 2025. It's really sort of when that strategic planning is um, supposed to take place. And I would encourage you all to take a look at, at that if you haven't gotten a chance already. Um, but as part of that, each one of the branches um, was was given the opportunity to sort of rejigger their high program priority areas. Um, and so at the contraceptive research branch, one of the areas um, that we knew was an area that we wanted to focus in on was really integrating the so socio-behavioral research into the product development pipeline. Um, so NICHD, as you may or may not know, actually has a very robust portfolio of socio-behavioral research around contraception, but this research um, has been predominantly focused on contraceptive use and non-use of currently marketed products, and there's basically been no research that's being done on products that are in the development pipeline. And talking with our colleagues at NAAID and you know outside of NIH that are working predominantly in the HIV space, they've found that this has been a very useful tool to try and improve the product uptake um, in their development of novel products for HIV prevention. So we knew that this was an area that we wanted to reach into. Um, so as part of that, sort of the first sort of step into that was really trying to get a pulse on the field for those um, who are working in this space. Um, <clears throat> So as Bethany said, we decided we wanted to host a workshop. And the goal of this workshop really was to have this multidisciplinary conversation from people working you know, in product development, in market research, in you know, ethnographic studies, um, social sciences, uh, HIV field, and try and get all of these people into a room such as it is. <laughs> um, and. Uh, really sort of have a conversation on what what are the what what strategies can be implemented to try and improve um, getting this sort of end user data into product development. 
So having said that, I just want to talk really briefly about the, um, the sort of layout and how it was organized and then talk a little bit about some of the points that were brought up over and over again. And I actually noticed that there was a couple of people who participated in the workshop on the call. So when I finish, if you, if, if those of you wanna, um, like uh, Betsy Tolley, I saw was on here and Giovanni Pauletti, and I think I saw Ariana van der Stratton as well. If, if you wanna chime in with some of your thoughts, that would, that would be great as well. Um, so the way that it was organized was, we thought it would be too broad of a discussion to have everybody um, sort of just talking about this problem, this, this, these sort of barriers um, in the abstract. So we decided to organize this around discrete products. And we wanted to have products from a wide variety of um, different sort of contraceptive needs. So we had, we invited product developers around male products, female products, on-demand products, um, sort of long-term products, um, as well as MPTs and non-MPTs. So this is, you know, IMPT. So I wanted to point out that we also brought in MPTs as well. Um, and then we had these sort of breakout discussions discussing the individual products and what those developers were um, facing when it came to what they were thinking about when it came to socio-behavioral research. And sometimes the answer was, we aren't thinking about it. Um, and that's, that's fine because that's where we're at now, but we need to try and get these developers thinking about it. So coming up with some of the strategies for these. And then at the end, after all of these individual discussions were completed, we came back together as a group and had a more broader discussion about what can be done. And so um, some of the things that people, like I said, that we heard repeated over and over again were uh, that product developers need to be thinking about these as early as possible and start gathering data as early as possible. And it, it doesn't have to be perfect data. Incomplete data is better than no data. Um, and then choices, try and when you're trying to um, uh, gather this sort of information, it's better to give your a question in, in, in the terms of choices as opposed to just sort of broad opinions. If you force a person to make a choice, it's gonna be more informative than um, just having their broad opinions. And then also incorporate the sexuality of the participant into the discussion. So ask not only, is this comfortable? Are you having side effects? But also, is this impacting your sex life? How does your partner feel about the product? So really incorporate it into the context of a sexual experience. And then obviously seek out previous literature. Um, those are sort of the highlights that, that I had. Um, I'm not sure if anybody else who participated in had, had more to add, but those are some of the things that I wanted to say. Travis, this is Betsy. Um, hey Betsy, how are you? Hey, it's good to see you. One, of the, things, one of the things that came, um, that I found interesting about the workshop was and I, I participated or sat in in a couple of the different conversations around products. And like you said, sometimes product developers weren't really even thinking about some of the kinds of questions that a potential end user might have or some of the ways that a product might use, uh, work, et cetera. The, 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 those early discussions were useful. And one of the things I found later, um, since that time we've engaged with ongoing discussions, um, the few different with developers and, it's the ongoing discussions, especially that start to generate more and more ideas, even in terms of like, ah, oh, well, we're now entering some kinds of evaluations, animal studies, but hey, there's some interesting, um, there's some interesting aspects of that animal study that might actually translate to human needs, preferences, desires, things that we could be looking into. So I guess one thing that I liked is it was a great, place to jumpstart conversations and start to get a shared vocabulary. And I think it's the ongoing discussions in whatever ways, and those might be just light touches that, that will generate even more ideas about how to integrate end users, providers, product developers, you know, into a sort of shared collaboration. Yeah, absolutely. Great. So this is really terrific. I'd like to ask if people can, um, um, you know, hold on to your questions or type them in the chat. Um, Travis, thank you so much for this. I think this is, um, you know, the workshop that you hosted was extremely fruitful. Um, and I think, 
you know, really scaffolded sort of the conversation where we want to go today. So, um, um, thanks, Bethany. You know, uh, yeah. Yeah. The only other thing that I would add oh, okay. is just this is an area that NICHD is, you know, it wasn't just sort of a one and done thing. So keep keep an eye on uh, on on news coming from NICHD in, in in this area. That's sort of all I can say about it at this point. But that's um, great. I do see Ariane was in the workshop, and before I introduce then our panelists, I wanted to see Ariane. Did you want to ask a quick question? I didn't want to ask a question. I just wanted to add a comment, um, Travis. I thought the workshop was really, um, um, from my perspective, a great success. Uh, the way it was handled, the um, separate groups, how we brought, we got back together and how everyone was really engaged. Um, another point that may be useful for others to know is I thought you picked the technology in an interesting way as well, because they were at different stages in the pipeline. So they were very mature technologies that were reevaluated and that they were very, very early stage, almost proof of concept. But they were really, it was interesting to see how they were really um, a dimension uh, around end user feedback that would be useful at all these different stages. So I thought it was well thought through. Mm -hmm. Great, thank wonderful. You. Thank, thank you. you. Again, Travis, thank you so much for framing that. Of course, that. of course. Great. Now, um, you know, I want to introduce everyone to our dynamic um, panel of MPT entrepreneurs and researchers who will be discussants um, uh, with us today. So we'll begin with um, Dr. Deborah Anderson. Um, who is a professor at Boston University School of Medicine with expertise in mucosal immunology, virology, and immune defense of the, of the genital tract against STI pathogens. Uh, we also have Mary Witzel, who is the founder of Yazo Therapeutics, and Mary has um, 20 years of experience in the field of women's reproductive health and 35 years of successful senior management experience. Um, Betsy Tully is a senior scientist. Um, we've heard her speak this morning. Um, she is a senior scientist at FHI 360 and leads a diverse team of researchers with backgrounds in anthropology, dem demography, epidemiology, and health behavior. Um, Khadija Ahmed is a, a medical doctor and clinical microbiologist and ch um, chief executive officer officer at Sashaba Research Center in South Africa and um, has been involved in an array of microbicide and MPT studies. And last but, um, well, actually not even last yet, we have uh, Joseph Marungo is uh, also a medical doctor and senior technical advisor for Pangea Zimbabwe Health Trust and has worked at different levels of the health delivery system in Zimbabwe, um, including the coordination of natural, uh, the National HIV Care and Treatment Program. And Matthew Quaife is on the faculty of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And um, most of Matthew's work is at the interface of health economics and infectious disease modeling and he's been involved in some really interesting um, MPT and HIV prevention studies as well. So to help um, facilitate this interactive discussion between our expert panelists and those of you who are Zoom, uh, joining us here on Zoom, um, the, we are structuring this with some brief um, uh, overviews of the products and development that are underway by Deborah Anderson's lab and um, uh, Yazo Therapeutics, and then we will transition into a structured discussion with all the, um, the behavioral uh, and clinical researchers, um, and then open it up for discussion. So as a reminder, we are muting, um, you know, just because we have so many people on here today, um, but we do encourage everyone to please use the raise hand feature and use the chat feature, and we'll do our best to, to address everyone's questions. So with that, I'd like to um, welcome Mary Witzel and Deborah Anderson. Um, so Mary and Deborah, you both have um, you know, been devoting your careers to, to developing products for women's health, um, reproductive health, and, and, you know, your work demands incredible tenacity. So uh, 
thank you for your time um, in the field overall and for being here today. So with Deborah, I will hand it over to you to talk about your monoclonal antibody-based MPT. Great, it's a real pleasure to be here. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm going to present a very brief snapshot of 10 years of work um, that I've done with an incredible team of scientists, product developers, um, uh, granting agencies, um, which were using monoclonal antibodies um, as a basis for um, multi-purpose uh, prevention technology. And um, we've been doing this research in layers. Um, we, um, and I'll introduce you to that in a minute. The advantages of antibodies are that they're natural products, so they shouldn't be, um, uh, they shouldn't cause side effects in the end users. In fact, the antibodies that we're using for um, HIV and human sperm were actually um, recovered from patients with um, HIV and infertility. So they're natural products, they're human proteins. Um, and even though passive immunization has been around for a century, um, it's a very exciting time to be in the field because there are new cost-effective production platforms available that enable um, the engineering of antibodies and the mass production of antibodies. They're becoming more cost effective. We use a plant to make our antibodies, for example, and there are new uh, platforms that are uh, coming online that are even more uh, cost effective than using plants. And plants are scalable. We're excited that we could perhaps transfer the technology to developing countries so they can make their own um, antibodies. Um, and we're on the crest of a wave. There are over 100 monoclonal antibodies currently approved for clinical use and new antibodies are introduced nearly every day now. So this is a very um, exciting field to be in right now. And there are infinite varieties of antibodies and combinations of antibodies. Um, each person has thousands of different antibody types circulating at any one time. So it's a very flexible uh, platform as well. May I have the next slide, please? So as I mentioned, we've been doing our research in layers. Um, our first uh, prototype product was MB66, um, which was a, a product that contained an anti-HIV antibody and a, an anti-herpes simplex antibody to protect women against those two um, sexually transmitted diseases. And um, we started this project in 2012 and have, um, I'm happy to say, just wrapped it up um, this month with our publication of the phase one clinical trial results. So um, at the bottom, you can see the milestones that we have to hit for each of these products. Um, you have to have the idea for a drug substance and manufacture it. You have to do a lot of preclinical testing. You have to manufacture your GMP drug substance and drug product. Um, there are uh, pre IND tests um, that are required. Um, you have to file for and get an IND to enable the clinical trials. And then we've taken um, MB66 through a phase one clinical trial. And um, throughout this um, milestone chart, we have socio-behavioral feedback. Uh, we've been um, very privileged to collaborate with um, Kate Guthrie, who's I think familiar to all of you. She's given us a lot of feedback uh, along the way. Our second product, which is currently under development, is ZB06. It's a monoclonal antibody to sperm, which has contraceptive activity. And actually, we just started our phase one clinical trial this month. So uh, we're hoping to wrap up um, this phase two of our product development uh, within the year. And so far, um, everything is looking very good with the anti-sperm antibody. And then our, our ultimate um, product, the next generation, will be a multiple um, antibody product containing um, STI antibodies. For the HIV um, antibodies, we'll probably uh, use multiple antibodies. Um, we'll, we'll continue to use the herpes simplex virus antibody and the sperm antibody, possibly multiple sperm antibodies. So um, that's a snapshot of where we are, <laughs> where um, as, as all of you are well aware, um, the phase one clinical trial is kind of on the edge of the, um, the valley of death, as they say in <laughs> pharmaceutical research. Um, it's very hard to get 
products uh, from the conceptual phase into the actual efficacy trials of phase one and phase, the phase two and phase three clinical trials. And we're hoping for um, quite a bit of assistance with, with that um, stage of development. Uh, may I have the last slide, please? So as I mentioned, I represent a, a huge team of just very uh, competent individuals. I was trying to calculate how many years of um, MPT experience we represent, and I think it's centuries of, of, of experience here, if you can consider our whole careers, MPT-related fields. Um, so we represent seven academic centers, um, five um, industry partners, and I want to highlight Map Bio, Zab Bio, who really have spearheaded this whole um, endeavor with their um, their plant antibody-based technology, Kevin Whalen, Larry Zeitlin, and Miles Brennan. And then we've had terrific funders. Um, our first product, the MB66, was funded by um, NI. AID, um, their IPCP microbicide development program really got us off the ground and rolling. We're doing our um, sperm antibody work currently with NICHD, and we have a contraceptive research development center grant with them to develop this antibody. And the Gates Foundation has also provided um, funding along the way. So thank you, everyone. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Deborah. Um, so we will um, yeah, move on now to uh, Mary Wetzel at Yazo. So Mary. Thank you. Um, we can get the first slide there. Go ahead. Um, we are currently funded by NICHD with a phase 2B SBIR. Next slide, please. Um, just a quick snapshot of the company. Um, I want to point out my two of my co-founders, Mike uh, Oldham and Barbara North, have been involved in this field since I think '81. I think um, they were the uh, uh, top managers, part of the top management team to develop the Today contraceptive sponge and had that commercialized. And then they repeated their uh, 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 worked together and they were on the team that developed and launched the Instead Soft Cup. So when I met them in 2000, I was in, uh, asked to come and run a little company called Ultrafem that made the Soft Cup and uh, changed the name to Instead. It's had a few different uh, uh, incarnations, but uh, those two were there and that's how I got to meet these two. Uh, and we also met uh, the researchers from University of Illinois and Rush University who licensed us first the um, uh, uh, acid form. And uh, we were there uh, and helped get that uh, first licensed and it's now been approved as FEXI. So it's had a very nice, uh, 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 nice to know that something got out there. Um, we've been funded, uh, all our work has been funded through the SBIR program. And uh, uh, although I don't have a slide to thank them, we, we've had interactions with a number of academics and it's been tremendously important for us to feel like we've got uh, a good product uh, going. Um, we did, after uh, we left instead, we uh, licensed another drug and this was from the University of Illinois at Chicago. Uh, next slide. Slide, please. Um, we, and we've, uh, I realized, oh, I don't even have a name. You're going to have to forgive me. This presentation was made while I live in Texas during rolling blackout. So I'd scamper to my computer when we had some electricity and try to get this done. And I'm using, you know, old, old slides, trying to give you something. Our drug is called polyphenylene carboxymethylene, PPCM. It's an interesting little drug. It's both contraceptive and it also is an attachment infusion inhibitor. Um, it's a small uh, polymer. And what's interesting about it is it has no sulfur. And we think that may be why we seem to have a slightly better safety profile from some of the other uh, polymers. Also the fact that it's a, a lower molecular weight. Um, this is our, this is a mock-up obviously, but it is a nice clear gel. We worked very hard at making this a lovely aqueous uh, gel that has very nice slip, um, dries to a nice fine film. It isn't sticky, it isn't tacky. And these are the kinds of things, um, I happen to have had a, a four year stint working in consumer products, which really is, a, a, a everybody should have a year or two in consumer products. It would really open uh, up a whole new tools 
uh, for everyone. Um, any event, the uh, the the drug is of course non-hormonal. It's very pleasant. Um, we believe it is going to be effective in humans and safe because we are currently um, uh, laboring hard and fast to submit our IND and hope to be into phase one clinical trials in uh, Q1 of 2022. Um, the other good thing about the drug is it's affordable, and there'll be uh, there's there'll be a topic on this later. But the issue of cost is important always to consider from the very beginning. Um, and knowing this field and what and how it's been framed for decades, you've got to take that into consideration. Um, the other thing that's really nice about the drug is because it's water soluble, we have a few different options for ways the dosage form could be formed. Um, next slide, please. Uh, just real quickly, I think everybody in this crowd recognizes these. This on the left-hand side of the slide shows how an attachment infusion inhibitor works. PPCM is attracted to the glycoprotein attachment um, sites, and um, it, we have found that it uh, works against a number of different viruses, um, which is all, all heralds a good future for this as a multi-purpose technology. On the right-hand side, we point out that the primary uh, way the drug is sperm uh, is a uh, uh, contraceptive is it causes the acrosome to react upon contact. And so once sperm loses that acrosome, it's really lost its ability to, to be fertile. Um, it may still be motile. This is not cytotoxic. This is not like nanoxanol 9. It simply causes the sperm to react and, um, uh, and they, may, they may reach, we don't know yet, but we may, it may reach um, uh, uh, the ovum and uh, but it should be unable to fertilize. It's lost all the enzymes it needs in order for fertilization. So you had a few other questions here um, that I'd like to address. And I, I uh, wanted to point out that A, you should always be thinking about the population who might be interested. And it doesn't mean you're gonna have hard answers from the beginning, but when we licensed acid form, we actually did formal focus groups and I, I, although I'm used to people wanting, you know, a general population of young women all want different hair products. I'm used to seeing this kind of stuff, but I was really surprised that I could not begin to pinpoint in those focus groups what kind of birth control a certain woman would use. You kind of, you get models in your head, you got to put those aside. Um, the, so target population, uh, definitely in our hearts, our team, would like to establish a profitable company that sells product in the um, uh, developed economies. But our goal is to have it at a cost and have a manufacturing partnerships so that it could be produced in lower economic uh, regions and really get that cost down. Our raw materials are low cost. I find that exciting as an old manufacturing person. Our raw materials, the synthetic method is a pretty simple method. So those are the kind of things that excite me and make me feel like we have promised to participate in um, lesser developed economies and provide perhaps a really robust, like I, a film, wouldn't that be dandy in a tropical region? So we get excited about the future. And I always say, I wish I had my magic wand so we could just have all this done and we could just go sell product and make the world a better place. Um, I think that we, so we started when we, when we finally really got funded was in 2013 from NIAID. And um, one of the first things we did was actually just go to SurveyMonkey. And we, um, uh, this was an inexpensive way for us to try and just get information. And women have enough, generally speaking, American women have enough information about different vaginal products. We, could, we did pictures. We had four different dosage forms and uh, described what the product could do. I think that was difficult, though, for them to understand that a, drug, a single drug product could do both contraception and disease prevention. We ran into that problem where American women don't really always think they're at risk for um, sexually transmitted disease, but they do understand uh, avoiding pregnancy. So we started with that and uh, we ended up with a tie between the film and the gel. We decided to develop the gel. 
Um, we were also having some trouble trying to formulate a, a, a film. And so it was easier for us to abandon that and just work on a single dosage form. So that's what we've been doing is following that path for now. Um, we found that when people, the, the problem you run into is with funders. Well, who's your customer? If you're talking to American investors, they say, who's your customer? And, and they'd love for me to say, oh, it's all young women between 18 and 24 that use iPhones. And that just isn't true. We, we, I'm sure in this population now all know, it's really what has to do with a woman's stage of life, um, her personal preferences, her medical condition. None of this is obvious and you can't just run ads targeting that that uh, demographic. But I think we're getting, at least for us internally, we're getting the, the message down nice and crisp, but I'm finally seeing the light bulb go on when I talk to potential investors uh, for this. So I think it's it's exciting to, they, they get it. Everybody knows at least one woman who's gone through you know multiple changes in her needs for contraception. Um, and, and I think you have to be patient too with, with your development. Uh, and well, I say I need to, like, I, I have no patience, but, um, I think that it's, you have to always keep evaluating what other people are doing. Uh, thus far, I feel like we still have an advantage in the niche that we're working in vaginal products. I think our product will be non-irritating. That's the very big deal. Um, the, and yet at the same time, nobody's really addressed the issue of mess that's one of the key objections to using uh, vaginal products of any kind is not only mess but somehow or other it's so obviously present it interferes with intimacy um, that's something that uh, I have ideas for how we could try to investigate it but um, that'll be another presentation on another day so I think that um, uh, you know we've come down to as I mentioned unsettled our, our target market for instance women in unsettled relationships, whether they're 18 or 35, um, mothers who want to space their children and don't want hormones, just want something simple that they use periodically. Oh, oh she's telling me time. I apologize. Um, so those are some of the things that we did in order to assess our market. Thank you. Sorry, Nika. So Mary and, and Deborah, these were fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, and I think really you know, it's really interesting to think about, you know, where as product developers, you know, to, to bring in the, the end user perspective, so many complicated issues. Um, and I'd like to ask that everyone um, who's joining us, um, uh, just, you know, note your questions and then we'll try to get to those um, after our, our discussion. I'd like to transition now to, um, you know, sort of reflecting on these presentations with the product developers transition now to our esteemed group of behavioral and clinical researchers. And as, as I mentioned, we're structuring this um, discussion around some um, high level topics. So we're gonna begin with looking at um, sort of building from decades of research to contraception um, um, and prevention of HIV and STIs what approaches um, and challenges can we learn from to, to really help ensure successful MPT? So um, I could begin with Betsy. Um, you have extensive experience at integrating in user research into product development for HIV prevention, including MPTs, and reflecting on the product development pipeline. Um, you know, and I know that, that Deborah actually also put up a slide on this. Um, we've, and, and then the products that Mary and Deborah described, can you reflect um, and describe briefly the types of approaches that you've used or familiar with? Um, no, sure, I'd be happy to. And I think there's a, a slide that, um, I actually lifted this slide off the internet. Um, the the uh, reference is quite small at the bottom. But one of the things I wanted to say is that they're, they're really uh, social behavioral researchers have a number of different tools that can be applied um, kind of variously across the product development pipeline. And um, if we think very early on at that sort of ideational or proof of concept phase, a product developer might have a particular drug in mind, but really not, not sure right away whether that is should be put forward in ter terms of a pill or a, a vaginal gel or maybe a rectal gel. 
there are various formulations and other aspects of the, of the kind of target product profile that they're thinking about. This is still a really excellent period of time to gather some early end user or potential end user provider key influencer input. And one of the ways that we've seen increasingly in the, in the product development space is use of things like human-centered design workshops, ideation workshops, where you bring people together across, across multiple perspectives. So potential end users of various um, demographics, perhaps partners, certainly providers or others. If you bring those, those folks together to talk about this potential product, what's the value proposition vis-a-vis -vis the, the market place that they, or the context that they are uh, living in, what are the pros and cons, the various trade-offs of, of formulation um, approaches, where would they see this product actually being delivered? So kind of participatory, highly qualitative types of quick input might be useful there. Um, uh, thinking also about, I think Mary brought this up, in terms of the pharmaceutical or even uh, commercial uh, production industries, Kate Guthrie has done a lot of work on something called perceptibility research. If you think about um, the ways that various kinds of chocolates melt in your mouth or the way that lotions feel on your skin, I think commercial producers do a lot of upfront work to figure out what is most appealing for people. But in our space, we don't spend much time with that. A vaginal gel, for instance, there may be various formulations. They could feel different, impact the sexual experience very differently. In fact, I saw that in the early microbicide gel trials, that while some women might perceive a gel as very liquidy and um, perhaps conveying the idea that, or at least to a, pro, to a partner, that this kind of liquidy feeling might, might um, make him think that she has an STI. Others in, uh, in other demographics, something uh, various formulations of gel might actually facilitate sex. So there are kinds of um, ways of evaluating the end user experience, the sort of more physical, perceptible experience of products using either proxies or using very low fidelity, again, in human-centered design, they'll oftentimes find ways of, of prototyping a product and gathering some early end-use experience around that from very low to higher fidelity products. I'm gonna, um, one of the other things around this sort of early and pre-human trial um, work, I'll just flag and pass on are, are the use of discrete choice experiments, which are more structured, more quantitative, but help you evaluate the trade-offs between um, various combinations or choices in, um, in product-related attributes. A couple of things I wanted to highlight around the, um, the uh, human trial is in terms of safety, thinking about the types of participants who actually join your trials. There may be value in looking at the experience of product use within trials, but at times, especially in phase ones, it might also be valuable to identify more real term uh, users and evaluate proxy products sort of as a parallel to those. And I'll stop here. That's great. Thanks so much, Betsy. Um, so I'd like to move over to Matt. So you have the perspective of a health economist um, and are involved in, in some really interesting um, MPT related work. Um, what approaches have you, um, do you see could be used to integrate um, the user provider and system perspectives for product R&D? Thanks, Bethany, and thanks, uh, thanks to the IMPT and team uh, for inviting me to this. Is, this is really cool. Um, so I think we now know quite a lot about people's hypothetical preferences for MPTs. I mean, people generally want things that work. Um, in the areas of high HIV incidence, people care very strongly about HIV efficacy. Uh, in areas of lower HIV uh, incidence, uh, people have preferences for contraceptive characteristics a bit more strongly. Um, we also know that other things matter when people choose a product. So there's been like 
tons of our preference research has shown that people want stuff that can be used less frequently. People want things that are familiar to them. So in areas of high Debo injectables for contraception, there are strong preferences for potential MPTs and PrEP delivered by injectable. Um, we also know from like the really great work of the RTA team, or the RTI team, sorry, of Ali Minnis and Ariana and colleagues, that the people's preferences adjust. So as people get used to using a vaginal ring, um, their preferences change. So I think we're a bit of a turning point now in this area of social and behavioral kind of preference research for things like PrEP and MPT. Um, and I've got, I, I've got three challenges. Um, I've got a challenge for social scientists and preference researchers. I've got one for product developers like uh, Deborah and Mary. Mary, it's really cool to hear about how you've incorporated this work. And I've got one for modelers, infectious disease modelers. So first, product developers, what are the decisions that you make during product development that are going to impact usability? So thinking about microbicides, are decisions made at some point that a gel is the best way to get a certain amount of antiretroviral into the vaginal tract, but that had clear implications for acceptability and ease of use. Um, so what's the, what are the next key decisions that are being made in this generation of MPTs that behavioral research could try and inform? You know, what dosing schedules do we use for trials? We see that with the COVID vaccine of three versus 12, 12 weeks and you know the impact that's had on policy. Um, what delivery mechanism is needed? I remember the early injectables had this really big needle that needed to go into your bum, and it's not a, it's not a good model for, for things that we need loads of people to use. Um, so I, you know, I've never been in a lab in my life. You know, I'd love to go, um, but I'd love to understand what drives these decisions and how they're made um, in the lab. Okay, that's challenge one. Challenge two for us behavioural researchers. Do we need any more hypothetical experiments that say people want something that works better that's used less frequently? Or can we push ourselves a bit more? So can we look at how preferences change as people get used to using products like the RTI work? Um, or can we really uh, properly engage developers to understand what information is going to be useful to inform um, product development and get evidence that's going to help that process? Um, and finally, for the infectious disease modelers, so I'll take off my preference hat and put that modeling hat on. So let's make it really clear that, that these trade-offs are important. Um, we, could, we could slog and slog and slog, get something that's 90% effective. If it's only used by 50% of people, that's less impactful, it's less cost effective than something that's 70% uh, effective, but used by 70% of people. So there are clear trade-offs there. And I think as, as modelers, we can make the argument that, that all of these things are important. Over. Wow, thank you. What great perspectives so that you both bring. Um, so now we'd like to move over to our next topic. And again, I want to remind everyone, please jot down your questions, throw them in the chat feature. Um, so our next topic is really um, to look at the challenges and insights that should be considered when recruiting diverse populations into end user research studies. Um, and, and including the insights from young people because we know that young people are particularly at risk. So Katicha, um, reflecting on your experiences, including the TRIO study that um, you've been involved with, um, what challenges have you experienced in recruitment of study participants into, um, into research for MPTs and microbicides? Okay, thank you very much. And thank you to everybody else for putting everything into perspective for us. So as I said, uh, as I was introduced, uh, you know, I run a clinical trial organization in Shushunguri, which is in the city of Tswane in, in the Gauteng province in South Africa. And it's been mainly a focus on HIV and HIV prevention. And behavioral science has become a, a really important part of this research that we have been doing. And we've heard a lot about uh, end users in, in this discussion up to now in terms of end user preferences and choices that needs to be uh, available for women that are going to ultimately use the product that they protect themselves against HIV, pregnancy, STIs, or whatever it may be. So in order to recruit um, and the challenges, so we've been part of the TRIO trial as I was introduced and TRIO is basically a placebo control trial, uh, sorry, a placebo trial only with placebo products and we tested three different delivery tools uh, in terms of either a vaginal ring or a, a tablet or an injection. 
And we wanted to basically get feedback from the participants in terms of what their preferences were. And each participant had a choice of really testing a product uh, for a month and then roll over to a second and, a th and the third product. And at the end of it, you know, they, could, they gave us feedback on, on what their preferences of products were. And there's a large number of determining factors in how they chose a product. Critically important was also privacy and uh, uh, ability not to disclose products to their partners. So recruitment is really no different uh, from recruitment into clinical trials. And I think the critical part of recruitment is that uh, your proper community education and, and, and participant in education needs to be done. People need to be uh, understand what you're doing, especially in, in terms of end user products. They need to actually look and feel and see the product before they decide that they want to participate. They need proper understanding of where the product is going to be placed, how is it going to be placed. And, and a lot of the, the people really expressed a lot of concern in terms of uh, when we introduced the gyno rings in the trio study, in the fact is how would that ring be inserted into my small vagina or, for example, would my partner feel it, would it slip out, uh, how do I know it's not going to harm me in any way. So those are the kind of things that, that women need to be reassured about when we're recruiting and, and a lot of uh, video graphics need to be used, a lot of pictures and things in order to, to understand what uh, participation in these trials are about. Also important is that, as we said before, people get comfortable using a certain product and then they don't actually want to uh, change. And it's more common with the, with the older age group, like, I mean, people like me, if I've been using something for a long time, whether it's a, a face cream or, a, or a, a body lotion, I'm very reluctant to change. So new technologies that are coming out now with vaginal rings and, and gels and foams and implants, a technology that needs to be introduced, uh, you know, in, in the proper way to the individual's proper explanations and benefits to them. I think important is that we have to listen to what end users want. And sometimes they, privacy might be the biggest factor in their life. They want to use a product that they don't need to, uh, their partner doesn't catch them out with, or they don't need to share with their partner, or it doesn't interfere in the relationship with their partner. And then others might be comfortable sharing a product with a partner, but what would want a product that is probably longer lasting. Uh, in general, I think most people are very altruistic, as Mary said. Uh, I think we want to do what, uh, make the world a better place. I think that is what people want to do. And if given the right information, the correct information during recruitment really overcomes a lot of these challenges in terms of recruitment. So. That's where I stop. Thanks, Nika, for reminding me about the time. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you. That's, um, you know, coming from your clinical perspective and those insights, I think is really practical and really, um, really good to consider. Thank you so much, Katika. Um, so Joseph, um, based on your work, um, with the SHIELD study and, and other HIV prevention work that you, you have. Can you share how um, some of the insights on product R&D from end users that, and including healthcare providers and how, um, how these insights can play a role? Uh, thank you, Bethany, and um, hello everyone once again. Um, so um, as introduced, um, uh, the Senior Technical Advisor for Pangea Zimbabwe AIDS Trust, um, and we are involved in various um, projects supporting HIV prevention care and treatment here in Zimbabwe. Um, but I'll just share our experiences with um, um, the SHIELD study and the other projects that we implement here in Zimbabwe. Um, and for SHIELD, we um, were getting support from RTI and funded by USID. Um, so, um, the aim of the project was to elicit end users' uh, perceptions on preferred characteristics um, for a product uh, that would provide dual HIV prevention and, um, and contraceptives. 
So what we picked up is um, is that there are um, there are two ends to the spectrum with an area of uh, intersection. So on one end, um, the end user insights can actually help with innovation and product refinement. Um, but more importantly, um, it helps to be um, client centered and responsive to the needs and preferences of the clients. Uh, which can then lead to better product uh, uptake. Um, and then on the other end, we have the healthcare providers who are quite influential um, in terms of uh, the delivery and uptake of uh, the different products. Um, but also at the same time, they have a lot of experience in terms of uh, all the other products that they've been working with and, um, and delivering. Um, so, so on the healthcare provider side, we picked up that um, they are they are interested in um, uh, safety, efficacy. Um, uh, for example, in this case, um, they would prefer a product that limits the risk of infection for the clients, um, and they are also interested in simplicity and convenience. Um, yeah so so um but also on the other end for the clients um they also prioritize issues of uh, cost uh issues of um a, a procedure or a product that that has less uh, results in less pain and um and scarring um and then on the intersection component you then have issues to do with uh, with convenience um responsiveness to the needs of the client and also uh, making sure that, uh, for example, in this case, we address the needs in terms of HIV prevention and um, and also uh, contraception. Um, so, so what becomes important is therefore to make sure that at the end of the day, we are addressing the healthcare um, providers' um, uh, needs and uh, preferences, but we're also at the same time making sure that the client's um, needs are also addressed, including what has been mentioned earlier around the social cultural, uh, social cultural norms. Uh, peer support is also important. Um, access, availability and access are also some of the important dimensions that need to be, to be considered. Uh, thank you very much. Back thank to you. you. That's, that's really helpful. Thank you, Joseph. Um, so Betsy, you know, you've been involved in a variety of trials yourself. Um, could you reflect on um, what motivates individuals to participate in research trials? Like um, Katita touched on this, so like the need for, you know, community education and, you know, illustrations, the challenges around switching products and you know taking something that is totally new i think your hand cream and face cream examples were really great and very relevant so betsy these are big challenges um what what can you advise what what's your perspective on this well i have sort of one observation around this and a couple of um suggestions i mean i think in the hiv prevention clinical trial world we've seen that people's motivations for participating in the trials can be quite varied and that and it does impact oftentimes how they how they um, use products adhere to products within clinical trials oftentimes phase ones they may be mainly altruistic and they're not actually um, the sort of designated you know eventual users of a product which um, is perhaps the way that it needs to be but that makes it difficult to understand end user acceptability in phase three trials I think we've seen also that people join trials for a whole host of other reasons, including access to better healthcare. Um, or, so I one, one issue is I think that we need to pay more attention to that. And especially in clinical trial sites and communities where they're just repeatedly trials that also can give rise to a kind of professional trial participant um, population. And, and it makes it much more challenging to understand end user, um, end user sort of acceptability and use. Uh, there are two kind of thoughts I had about um, ways to deal with this. I mean, one, or, and maybe not deal with it, but just take it into account. One thing is I wonder whether earlier on in the product development process, we can already be paying more attention to 
what is this product? How do we describe it to our, to the populations that we would like to uh, recruit into trials? What are some of the questions and the concerns that would need to be addressed that might make it easier for them to join trials? And I think that's a little bit what Katija was getting at in, ter in terms of having very you know good information, visualization, helping people understand the, the, the value of participating in the trial. So I think that's one thing. And, and I think that should be done earlier on in the process so that by the time you get to human clinical trials, you're already set with that. And then the second thing I would, I, um, I've been working for a while on, you know, trying to identify the kinds of um, the propensity, for instance, of participants who join trials, especially later stage trials, to actually use, want to use, adhere to products. And so that's a work that's ongoing. But what are the characteristics of individuals? Are there ways to actually measure, evaluate that as a screening tool so that you know who you are, you're uh, recruiting into the trial? And those who actually have big concerns about the whole clinical trial proposition, but they would like to join because of other reasons, maybe you identify that early. Whether or not you screen them out is another question. I mean, there's a, an ethical issue there, but do you identify and kind of flag that and, um, and find ways to interact with those types of participants? Or do you try to prioritize ones who understand what the product is and can be, understand what the, uh, the activity of trial participation is, are, are interested in actually using, experiencing, and providing feedback on the product itself. So those are just a couple of ideas and I'll, I'll pass it back to you, Bethany. Yeah, that's great. Thanks so much. Um, I think, you know, we've, we're, we're hitting on so many rich, rich topics right now. And I wanna, for sake of time, I wanna um, move on to the market landscape discussion and then we can open it up to discussion mm -hmm. for the group. Um, so, you know, as we think about, um, you know, understanding, you know, the market landscape, we know that NPT users are heterogeneous, heterogeneous populations, and, and we've talked about this, um, touched on this, and that their desires around products are not simply going to align with their, their life stage, although it's, it's going to definitely, you know, be related to that, but there are other social demographic characteristics too. Um, these markets are not necessarily um, just consumer driven, but also determined by the donors and national and international policies. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, it's it, all of these different complexities need to be aligned in some way, um, if possible. Um, so Betsy, again, coming back to you, understanding this landscape is really complex. Do you see a landscape um, for NPTs that can be available for the diverse needs of end users? Well, I think it's, I think it's a long time coming because I think especially for, um, for adolescents and young women in, in African settings, you know, this is women's perspectives on fertility on, and on pregnancy, I think affect a lot of their sexual reproductive health behaviors. And so combining looking for products that are both um, HIV and or SDI and contraceptive, I think there will be huge demand. So the issues are gonna be really more, how do we, how do we um, as we begin to introduce products and even before that thinking about them, um, how do we ensure that those populations who would like to uh, take advantage of those products actually have access to them? Joseph mentioned, the role of providers and they're so important. Um, and we should be thinking about that again earlier, that, much earlier than when we get to the product introduction stage because clinical trial staff are very different, I think, than the kinds of providers who will eventually be making these products ex uh, accessible. Um, I also think that just, again, the sort of communication aspects of products um, and, and then I, honestly working with policymakers who need to understand who are the populations that are most interested in that could, could benefit most from these products and, and um, engage them early in conversations so that they can figure out ways to actually make, make them accessible and not um, you know, 
as we begin to introduce products, set up a lot of barriers that will continue yeah. to keep women from using them and men and couples. Yep. Matt, from your perspective, do you have anything to add to that? Sort of wearing your health economist policy hat? You know what? I was I was hoping you weren't going to come to me, Bethany, because I think Elizabeth's covered the points that I was I was going to make. So I'm going oh, to no, I'm sorry about that. We should have started no, with you, Matt. That's fine. That's great. Um, yeah, I know, you know, Kachita and, and Joseph, from your perspectives, you know, you do work across, you know, in your clinic settings and with policymakers, if you have anything to add to what Betsy said on these issues, because they're certainly complex. I think that I just want to reiterate more that what Betsy said is that, you know, uh, the product that uh, needs to be made accessible to the population that you're testing it in and the cost becomes a big factor. So it, it's well and good to test very uh, products that are expensive to make, but if they don't become available to the, the, the individuals that you've tested it into, uh, there's a lot of despondency and, and dismay in the population groups as well. And that also results in a lot of research reluctance and participation mm -hmm. in research. So I think we must be quite uh, aware of that as well. Yeah, Joseph, anything to add? Yeah, I, I, I also agree um, with uh, my colleagues, um, um, but just to emphasize again that um, we also need to make sure that um, we, we look at the different uh, dimensions of quality as well, uh, including access, which includes availability and affordability, um, but also at the end of the day, making sure that um, the product is client centered uh, from both the um, provider perspective as well as um, the consumer at the end of the day. Thank you. Great. I want to go to Mary and Deborah, but before so, I think Travis can um, put in a question that I think is, is relevant to where we are right now in the chat. Um, and his question is, you know, recognizing that people whose contraceptive and anti-infective needs are not currently being met are also those that are really difficult to reach um, and the least likely to participate in the clinical trials. How do we, how do we best address this? And um, I leave this open. I don't know which of you would like to take that on. So maybe I can start. Uh, you know, we, we work in populations who, who have difficulty where their infective needs are not met, but they're not really difficult to reach out populations. I think from our experience working in these populations is that they need to, you need to reach to them. So you might have to take the research to them. Uh, there might be some technologies that would be difficult to reach out to them. So for example, if you want to do online surveys and things like that, that will be more difficult to reach. But uh, uh, you know, if you have proper education and proper engagement with them, they would be open to conducting uh, focus group discussions with mm -hmm. and in-depth interviews with. And then, so it's not a, a difficult population. It's just that you need to use the right uh, uh, technology and the right means of approaching them, I think. Yeah, OK. Great. And I, I would like to comment that here in the States, I live in, I've, I'm living in Texas, and then uh, I'm a native of Arizona. And both those states resist um, and, and pretty much prohibit um, sex education for kids. And I raised a teenager here, so I know the impact of that and am still shocked that some of these kids are now in their 30s and still don't understand birth control or how people get pregnant. Uh, it's, uh, it's amazing. So we have a legal barrier where a, a, a woman under the age of 18 in Texas cannot go to a doctor and get birth control without a parent or guardian actually going into the doctor appointment with her. So I'm, I'm just, you know, that's, and that's a whole group of people there that it's, it's terrible. You know, that we, we, you know, hamper these young people at a time that's so critical in their life without the knowledge uh, of, and, um, you know, solutions to make sure they're taking care of themselves. And there's, you know, we've heard all kinds of other stuff. And I, in, in our case here in the US, I don't know, somebody beyond Planned Parenthood, and there may be out there, but more proactive leadership, maybe from, you know, their influencers, their thought leaders, but somehow or other, the information and the education 
is here, but it's not getting down to those kids. And um, so I'm just giving an example of what I think is a problem when there's legal constraints or even some cultures where perhaps women don't even get, are not the deciding, they're not the decider if she gets to use birth control. So I, I think those are big, big deal. And uh, there's there still has to be policy work at the top to try and unfetter information. Um, so that's my soapbox, thanks. And our view is that um, a very important product is an over-the-counter on-demand product that might address some of these teenage girls that can't go to physicians for um, birth control. Um, our team started with a gel-based uh, monoclonal antibody product. Um, we took that through the um, animal work, but then we rapidly um, adopted um, a film product, which uh, hopefully could be over-the-counter um, on-demand um, product. And we were delighted in our phase one uh, clinical trial, which used the film product, that we had efficacy out past 24 hours. We had a lot of product left in the vagina at the 24 hour time point that protected all of the women in ex vivo um, efficacy trials. So we're excited about the film, but um, we're now um, also developing um, IVRs that uh, would release antibodies for, um, we hope, uh, at least a month. And so what we wanna do is offer an array of products um, to women so that they can, they can use what fulfills their, their needs. That's great. Thank you, um, Mary and, and Deborah, because your perspectives, you know, in the trenches, in the lab, developing these real life challenges and addressing them. Um, I am seeing that we have some really great questions coming in through the chat. <laughs> so um, at this point, I'm going to, um, you know, people can unmute themselves. Um, but I'd like to, so I see a couple, here's one from um, Amelia McKenzie. Would you, can you unmute yourself? And otherwise we can. So um, would you like to pose your question to the group? And introduce yourself, what's your affiliation? Sure, thanks. Thank you, Bethany. Can you hear me all right? Yes, great. Okay, great. Uh, my name is Amelia McKenzie and I'm a scientist at FHI 360. Um, I've been doing a lot of thinking um, and, and with Betsy, one of my, my dear colleagues about um, an, a topic that a few people have kind of touched on a little bit, including Betsy, um, this issue of sort of facilitating communication and shared learning and knowledge between such diverse groups. So product developers and behavioral researchers come at questions from very different perspectives. They have very different trainings, different you know, lexicons. Betsy talked about sort of a shared language, for example, very different approaches. And so I'm curious on ways that we can really bring them to get it together in meaningful ways. For example, um, the NICHD um, convening that was uh, last year to think about sort of best practices on how we do this in integration work. Um, and I think that that sort of, it's not necessarily, those are research questions that may not always fit within an RFA, but I think they're really important and, and would still be warrant funding about how we build that um, mutual understanding on teams and those and, and pr promoting those kind of diverse teams and, and importantly throughout the development process. So including from the very beginning, like some of um, the panelists have talked about, I'd be curious what, what panelists, uh, what thoughts panelists uh, have on, on that question of how we, how we bring people together and sort of develop some of these best practices about um, about the integration moving forward. Great. Thoughts? <laughs> you from the panel would like to take that on. I honestly would like to, to hear from um, some of the others what, what they think, especially on the product development side, you know, Mary and Deborah, what what has worked for you and and um, what has been valuable. Sounds like both of you have had already some experience around um, you know, finding that shared language between behavioral social science researchers and, and lab, um, and lab you know, in development, sort of basic scientists. Well, we um, started our socio-behavioral research by reading the literature. <laughs> 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 But then we were uh, very fortunate to uh, be able to integrate at Kate 
Guthrie into our program and she's such a delight to work with, gives us a lot of feedback about various aspects of our product development. During our clinical trial, she um, interviewed women about the acceptability of our film and uh, provided very reassuring data. So uh, yeah, you just have to use whatever you can. <laughs> Scientists don't always think about the behavioral uh, side of things, but uh, we're, we're trying our best. Right. So, I I oh, I'm sorry, sorry, I was just going to say, and my my experience was, you know, bringing in sort of more from what comes from consumer products and how they did market research, but also in any opportunity, it, it's been interesting. Every time I've done a presentation, they'll always be about what we're doing. Um, you'll get a, a small cluster, usually of young people, coming up and as much of it comes from men as women who are interested mm -hmm. in this product because their wife or girlfriend is really struggling with trying to find a contraceptive that works for them. And when will this be ready? And it's sort of interesting to see how it's an undercurrent sort of thing. And I think that w when we get to the point where we get to get beyond, you know, into clinical trial, our, our, clini our phase one, we hope we'll have some efficacy data, which will be helpful. Um, using a, a certain assay. But after that, that's something where we, we got to be more proactive about really getting noisy about this mm -hmm. issue. It's so, it's treated so respectfully that I think a lot of people kind of miss it for all the other news that's mm -hmm. going on out there. And the second thing I'd like to see, and maybe this is something I can talk more with Travis about, but is is making sure that young people, not only do they have to know about this, they have to see how important important this is to their whole future life it's a big deal you know pregnancy and stis and it's it's as big as an important as planning your college degree as far as i'm concerned so you know we need to somehow integrate that into our communications and i, I keep picking on young people but they're the most at risk um but that that's what i i think and hope that perhaps we later on when we have more resources can can do more of more proactive education at a broader level. Can, can I add one, one quick thing? Sorry, Bethany, I'll make it super quick because one other thing that just occurred to me, some years ago I was involved in some of the, the um, biomedical behavioral review panels that the HIV side of NIH, you know, uh, NI, NIAID was sponsoring. And for me, that was like, I was, I was oftentimes the only behavioral researcher sitting in a panel with product developers and, uh, you know, molecular biologists, et cetera. But it was a fascinating, it was a really fruitful kind of discussion. And I'm just wondering whether it's in our own institutions or through like NIH reviews or USAID reviews or whatever those end up being, having a more multidisciplinary approach to reviewing concepts, you know, ideas as they, as they develop, um, rather than only having your one disciplinary perspective, you know, until you get out and start trying to implement something. Anyway, yeah. just a quick one. Great. So I want to, I'm seeing some, some questions that people have been patiently holding their hands up. So I see Travis, um, Sumia um, from Pop Council, Arkana Krovi, and um, Matt Quaif. So if I've missed anyone, just keep putting your notes in there. <laughs> so we'll start with Travis. Um, Thanks, but Bethany. we only have about 10 or 15 minutes left, so. Yeah, I just wanted to address this question about how best to integrate these sort of multidisciplinary things, because that's something that we're actively um, trying to tackle at NICHD. Um, we had previously tried to, as part of our large center grants, multi uh, PI grants, we tried to incorporate um, behavioral research and make that a requirement for the grant. And it was a nightmare because you would have, you would have like a really good behavioral project and then sort of subpar development projects or vice versa and it would tank the whole thing and so trying to fund these things it was it was it really was sort of uh, a disaster and it's kind of one of the things that we're trying to um, trying to tackle at NACHD and, and really sort of what's the most seem instead of sort of slamming these two things together and hoping that it all works out and, and can importantly, get through a review process. Mm -hmm. um, how, how can we do it in a more seamless way where the, it's more integrated than sort of just 
stapling some researchers together at the hip and hoping for the best. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah. Thanks, Bethany. So I wanted to make just a comment on the markets uh, landscaping uh, discussion, which is that oftentimes this landscaping is, is written from a point of view of what is the size of the market, uh, who are the particular market segments. And it's a way of, uh, the way I've seen it being presented as, as uh, uh, providing the rationale or the business case to both investors and product developers to step into the space. Uh, and there's kind of like more of a light touch on once the product becomes available to the consumer, how is it going to be provided through which distributor? Uh, what kind of points of care? Is it going to be your community-based chemist? Uh, so related to that, what happens then is you have to figure out the financing for it. Who's going to pay coming at these various different uh, uh, level. So and I just wanted to, to highlight that as something that we need to have a more robust picture of what the market landscaping looks like. And mm -hmm. since I do have the floor, I, do, I want to ask our R&D partners here uh, on the panel as to, did you ever do this sort of market landscaping as a pre-step for jumping into the space? Is this a requirement from where you sit? Good question. Uh, I'm assuming that, yes, um, certainly in the beginning, you can start at a really high level and um, just know the size of the contraceptive market. And there had been a really good analysis done. And Kevin Whaley was one of the people who did it way back uh, about and just trying to, and gosh, I think they had somebody from McKinsey helping them. And they looked at the microbicide market. So you had these very high level projections. And then you, but you have to keep it triangulating all the time. And you bring up a good point. I, I didn't want to bog down. A, a, we have such a short time together, but the channels really are important. And I, it, I won't be surprised if all of us, I'm not sure, I don't know enough about monoclonal antibodies, but I know for us with a new drug, we're probably going to be forced to sell first through prescription here in the United States then, but we believe it's going to be safe enough. It can go to OTC. And I understand that transition. I don't know much about Europe. I'm trying to learn it. And I certainly know very little about any African country, but we'll get there. But with safety comes the ability to choose your channels of distribution. So that's the kind of thought process we've given to it. So we, we know it fits. We know there's an outlet for it. We know what's ideal. It's not prescription initially for what we're making. Um, we don't think, but we'll get there. Great, thank you. Anything to add, Deborah? Uh, no, um, I work with Kevin Whaley, so I think we followed some of the same uh, pathways that, that Mary has followed. Great, thank you. Um, Kana, i um, like to move over to you. You've had um, your hand up, so if you could introduce yourself and I'd love to hear from you. Thank you, Bethany. Um, my name is Archana Krovi. I'm a scientist at RTI International. Um, and I just wanted to thank everybody for this wonderful discussion. I was just thinking back about my own personal experience, and it's kind of embarrassing to say that I had zero sexual education growing up in India, where all of this is taboo. Um, of course, this was 20 odd years ago, so hopefully things have changed now. But from a cultural standpoint, it was never something that was taught. And of course, birth control or methods, you know, other methods is not even discussed. So taking a step back, I was curious to see if there were any initiatives or efforts to work with local schools or organizations that facilitate sexual education for younger girls and, you know, then make them aware of the variety of options that are available. Um, I think that will provide a more wholesome experience instead of you know, younger women having to deal with it when perhaps it might be too late. I'll just, I'll just, since this has been something near and dear to my heart, I'll just pipe up. I think that based on the, the, the studies I've seen done, ideally, it, it, it's, a, it's a pity, but parents, not a pity, 
it's just a pity they don't respond. I think most kids would like to hear about this stuff from their parents, at least here in the United States. And the, the failure rates for kids to hear even a peep mm -hmm. about birth control, conception, sex, relationships from their parents is shocking, especially for young men. I think it's particularly bad. So yeah, the next step is schools. And that, you know, is here, it's all, all gets caught up in, in politics, unfortunately. Yeah. So then you come down to, well, gosh, can you get Kim Kardashian to have a little blog going or, you know, you know so how do we get this information out? But that's yeah. certainly my personal frustration. Yeah, totally agree. And it is definitely something that we at the IMPT are thinking a lot about and have some, some you know, so we'd love to continue this conversation, but we have five minutes left. So I want to be sure and get to Matt for your, for your thoughts. You had something to add. Yeah, I just wanted to to give a plus one to Travis's point about hard to reach populations. Uh, also acknowledging that that here it's two white men talking to each other about how to reach hard to reach populations of which we are not. Um, but we, I think, it's just so critical. We work with groups and people who are already working in these in these uh, in these areas and with these people. In a, a slight plug to the uptake project, which we are starting. Um, with IRV uh, in Kenya and Uganda. We're working really hard to build off the experience and knowledge of people who are who are fully embedded within hard to reach populations and, and knowing the value of that, um, I think is really critical. Over. Wonderful. Um, well, we are right about at time. So um, I just wanna thank our our discussants for taking the time to prepare all of your remarks um, and your slides and, and being on with us today. And then every one of you who've joined today. Um, you know, I think we, we've just sort of tipped the, hit the tip of the iceberg with this conversation. Um, you know, lots more to think about. Um, we will be posting the slides on um, um, on the website, the IMPT website, the recording of, of this conversation. And also just wanted to remind everyone there are some readings that our discussants have shared and suggested that could provide background too. So um, again, thank you everyone. Um, and you know, we look forward to keeping in touch. Thank you, have a great rest of your, your days and evenings. <laughs> Thank you, Bethany. Thank you. Thanks, all. Bethany. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.